I just got off the bus in Innisfil, Ontario. Next stop, the beach. As usual, I'll be taking public transit, but there's a twist. In Innisfil, transit is Uber. Okay, what is it? Five dollars? That's 375 American. In 2018, Innisfil's government made news when they started heavily subsidizing Uber rides within the town borders in place of transit. The system works because Innisfil is basically just farms and exurban sprawl, and because riders are capped at 30 subsidized rides per month. Also, now it costs the town more than the original proposed bus system would. In short, I'm not impressed, but Innisfil's experiment has brought back an old idea, replacing transit with private cars. Some even argue that it would be cheaper to shut down existing transit systems and give everyone vouchers instead. It would be cheaper to buy every rider a brand new Tesla. Cheaper to give every transit rider in San Diego County a brand new Tesla. If you want to help poor people, give them a car. If you're watching this video, you probably don't take these people very seriously. I don't. But they pose a serious question. With the money we spend on transit, could we achieve the same social benefits, but with cars? And what would happen if a city actually tried doing this? That is what I want to find out. NBC Charlotte uncovered what some may consider major taxpayer waste. Empty seats being bussed all over town, and that comes with a hefty price tag. What could you get for all that cash that's being spent to shuttle just a handful of people on each bus more than 60 times a day? For comparison's sake, you could get 12 of these bad boys, these GMC Yukons, $80,000 a pop. If you've dipped your toes in the world of transit advocacy, you may have encountered this common rhetorical tool among transit opponents. It goes like this. Funding transit as a welfare service is paternalistic. It would be more equitable to use the money to give poor Americans what they really need, cars. Paratransit would stick around for those physically unable to drive, but everyone else could finally bask in the freedom and prosperity of car ownership. A new era of equality on the open road. As an urbanist, I think this plan would be enormously destructive, but I also wonder if it would even be possible. Let's start with the obvious. Replacing the largest transit systems with cars would be geometrically impossible. Even after COVID, a rush hour commuter train in New York typically has over a thousand people on board when entering or exiting Manhattan. Put all those people in cars on a highway at a generous assumption of two cars for every three people, and you have 8.3 lane miles of traffic from just one train. Parking is even more hopeless. Last year, when many Wall Street offices were still remote, the PATH station alone dumped over 22,000 commuters into Lower Manhattan every weekday morning. Parking the cars of all those business boy bosses would require a parking garage bigger than the World Trade Center. Where would that even fit? Not here. You get the idea, but that's NYC. What about smaller cities where more people drive than ride transit? Like Philly. Well, in those cities, there are still core routes that move too many people to be replaced with cars. For instance, even though the market Frankfurt is only carrying a terrifying 50% as many rides as in 2019, it still gets 55,000 rides each weekday. And that's just one line. Within Center City Philly, subway and regional rail stations get around 100,000 boardings each weekday. For reference, there are less than 46,000 parking spaces in all of Center City. So maybe transit is essential downtown, but what about routes serving suburban sprawl? Some bus routes are designed not to attract as many rides as possible, but to provide low-frequency service to as many places as possible. In their annual report, SEPTA categorizes these intentionally inefficient routes as suburban, and together they get almost 19,000 rides a day. So if we shut down all 24 of SEPTA's coverage routes, how much money could we save? $35.6 million, about 7% of subsidy to bus service system-wide, so not a lot. But the real question is if that money could buy cars for the thousands of stranded passengers. SEPTA's Suburban Travel Monthly Pass costs $115 a month, so we need to cover the difference between that and car ownership. This is a low-budget welfare program, so everybody's getting a Kia. Apologies to Kia. According to AAA, each car will cost at least $6,746 a year, costing taxpayers $5,366 if we're making the user pay $115 a month. This budget would cover vehicle acquisition and vouchers for maintenance and fuel. So that means we can support car ownership at the cost of a SEPTA pass for 6,640 households. Access to this program would probably be determined by income. What would be the cutoff? 
the lowest income bracket in the U.S. Census is deep poverty, or $7,290 a year for a one-person household. So we can give cars to those people, right? Well, the problem is that SEPTA's three outer counties have over 8,000 households in deep poverty. So to get your government Kia, you would probably need to make less than $6,000 a year. If you make more, you can buy the damn car yourself. But what if you're physically unable to drive? Thanks to demographic surveys SEPTA did for their bus network redesign, we know that about 5% of riders on coverage routes are disabled, and around 15% are seniors, meaning they would have access to SEPTA's paratransit system. Sorry, 15-year-olds. So if we shut down all coverage routes, we can assume that at least 15% of those riders would want to switch over to paratransit. The problem is that paratransit is extremely inconvenient, requiring you to call and make your reservation the previous day. So let's say that only 8% switch. That's still over 470,000 rides a year. Because each SEPTA paratransit ride costs taxpayers around $40, we need to budget in $19 million more a year. So now we're using more tax money for a system that's worse than buses in almost every measurable way. And remember, we're trying to replace the least cost-effective form of transit. Other transit is either too cost-effective to replace with cars at all, or operates in places too dense for everyone to drive. The case for transit is airtight. But maybe you're not convinced. Private cars are too pricey, but what if buses could be replaced with on-demand shuttles? This idea, called microtransit, is common in rural areas like Innisfil or small towns like Bellefonte, PA. But what about in big cities? In the last five years, cities across the country have joined in on demand response, largely thanks to a company called VIA. The company sells contract-operated demand response systems to local governments like Camden, which launched one this summer. At VIA, we've set out to re-engineer public transportation. Transportation is changing. Traditional public transportation solutions are becoming outdated, and technology-based solutions like VIA are the way of the future. Now, I'm not saying that these programs are bad, but VIA and their promoters market demand response as a cost-effective replacement for low-performance bus routes. And that claim is quite a stretch. In Arlington, Texas, riders pay $3 a ride, but each ride uses $11.66 of tax money. In Jersey City, where trips are shorter, VIA uses $10.75 of tax money for every ride on a $2 fare. A little context here. For short local trips, $10 is high. In fact, it's so high that despite SEPTA paying their drivers 40% more, every SEPTA route has better financial performance than VIA. Except these two. Oh, look at this thing. It's hideous. Why does this matter? Well, when Arlington launched VIA in 2017, they shut down their only bus route as a cost-saving measure. But for most of its four-year existence, that bus cost taxpayers less than VIA now costs per trip, and less than a million dollars in total. Now, with VIA charging over $8 million a year, Arlington is paying a whole lot of cash for the privilege of being America's biggest bus-free city. VIA is really working for Arlington. Now, that mayor argues the money is all worth it because VIA liberates riders from the tyranny of routes and schedules. But do riders actually want that? Bus 87 here is almost completely inside VIA's Jersey City Zone, and the fare is roughly the same too. And yet, this one route attracts 3.6 times more rides than the entire VIA Zone. So what's wrong with these people? Who would choose this technologically obsolete dinosaur when the same fare gets door-to-door -door service at the touch of a button? What I'm hinting at here is that on-demand isn't as great as it sounds. VIA likes to quote short average wait times, but these are averages, and vans often come half an hour after being called. This is much worse than a half-hourly bus, because you don't know an arrival time until after you've called it. Once on board, vans meander unpredictably to serve other rides. Is this really better than a scheduled bus? Empirically, most riders don't seem to think so. Now, VIA's spokeswoman wanted me to mention that ridership is growing, and it is. But that's not necessarily a good thing, because unlike with buses, the cost of demand response escalates in proportion to ridership. If a city can't afford to put more vans in the ride zone, the service becomes unusable as wait times grow longer and longer. That's what's happened in cities like Jersey City, which have had to pay more each year, a lot more. So is VIA just scamming cities? 
Not exactly. If your city's goal is universal transit coverage, demand response is a proven solution for serving areas too small, too rural, or too unwalkable for normal buses to ever run. But if your city wants to boost ridership, the cheapest way is fixed routes, even in the suburbs. And if your city wants to save money, flexible routing probably won't do the job unless it's run so badly that ridership drops. One more thing. VIA has their eyes on replacing human drivers with autonomous vehicles. This would make service hours cheaper, but by then, normal buses could be automated too, and fixed routes will still have the advantage. Because whether it's a robot or a human driving, a service that makes riders wait in a straight line at the same time is more efficient than a service that zigzags to pick people up when and where they request it. No computer will ever be smart enough to change that. Even if we could somehow fit all these pods into a dense city, the safe bet is that demand response will never replace buses and trains. It's a different tool for a different job. But as I mentioned before, I think 80% of American cities, probably the fixed route option probably doesn't work. To walk and wait, get on one bus and then get off and wait and transfer to another bus and get off and walk. Yeah. Instead, we should have some kind of dynamic bus or dynamic van that picks her up, picks up other people, and this can change every day depending on where people are going, what time. It just needs to be dynamically created schedules. Transit ridership has been declining for quite some time, and COVID-19 has added just another dimension to this. But there is an opportunity to make things better. These people and their companies want your city to believe that fixed route transit is a dead-end technology and to buy their techno-taxi services as a replacement. The problem now is that with national transit ridership still under 80% pre-pandemic levels, some leaders are starting to seriously consider these proposals for vans, cars, or autonomous pods to replace buses and trains. But this ridership crisis is much worse here in the States than most other countries, and it doesn't take a genius to figure out why. This train can't drive right up to your house, but that wouldn't be such a problem if you could physically walk here without dying. Sure, maybe we could buy people cars to help them survive in this hostile environment of our own creation. Or we could just build our cities like the rest of the world does, so people don't need cars in the first place. To me, that sounds a lot cheaper.